I think we're All live. Right. How's everyone yeah. doing? My name is John. I am the Tattoo Historian. I'm here with my great friend Alexander Stowe on the program. We're going to talk about allies, Civil War interpreters, public historians, and academics working together. How you doing, brother? I am good. Another another Monday working working from home, which is a little different, but uh, uh, I do not complain. I'm very blessed to have a job that I can work remotely, and so uh, I've got no complaints. Yeah, that's great. I, I love you've been doing some other stuff on Zoom and our live streams, and I've been loving the backdrop because you're sitting in front of your bookcase and all that. You know, I've been trying to scan what books you have back there. So this is actually uh, I had started. Um, I'm lucky that my father had worked from home uh, a couple different times in his career. So I saw, saw how he did it and like he had very much a routine and, and so on. So when I, we started working from home, I think this is, I think I'm on week three. I don't know, man. It's a blur. But yeah. when I started working from home, what I did was I set myself a timer on my phone. And so I have like a space to work up in my bedroom. I set this space up here. I have the kitchen table, dining room table, right? And then there's a, a home office that we've put. And so it's like, just keep moving around the house. And then I was like, oh, I'll do this. This is fun. Yeah. And then uh, our, our mutual friend, the great, the great general, Steve Fon, <laughs> oh, yeah. uh, he, was, he was busting me about the first core flag. And I'm like, oh, I think it's in a, it's in a cedar chest so it doesn't get moth eaten And he's like, you should hang it up. Yeah. Which has been great because people who, you know, it, it's a it's an interesting learning tool because they're like, oh, Alex, I didn't know you're so interested in Japanese uh, culture. Like, uh, <laughs> where, I don't remember you studying that in college. So it's a it's a good talking point. Oh, I, I should have thought that Steve Fon was the one that gets you on that and oh, like, oh, put it up. Oh, yeah. That's yeah. <laughs> it's not a surprise. <laughs> He he and I spin each other up very well. We can we can do this whenever, but if uh, his stories, as one of the National Park Service uh, Black Powder um, observers mm -hmm. involved with the 147th New York program we did for the 155th, mm -hmm. it was as great for us that we had him come so we could do the program right. as it was for him to be there to be involved in the program. Yeah. So uh i think that's it's just kind of a cool thing we spin each other up on so yeah i was uh we'll talk about that later i was actually there watching you guys do that as a spectator and uh i know that he shows up in like half of my photos because he won't get away from you guys he's like he's right there and he wants to be in the mix and i'm like yeah that's a guy who is close with the interpreters and oh yeah and i'm sure we'll go over that uh event and others uh later on because we're going to be talking about the blending basically of uh, what we see is the interpretive field and public history, uh, sometimes academics coming along for the ride and compared to what we saw years ago. Um, and I want to talk about you as an interpreter right off the bat, because I've, I've never heard when you started being an interpreter, when you started reenacting and all that. So how oh, long ago was that? I'm one of those. So when I was a wee child, no, no um, so man, I, I've I've led I've led a wonderful life. I, I really have very few complaints, and I was very blessed in my family that the matriarchs uh, were very very um, good at preserving the family history. Actually, uh, up on the top bookshelf amongst the first editions is Uncle Tom's Cabin that my grandmother had kept, and God rest her. And I will not cry, but. Um, she died the fall of my senior year of high school and my graduation gift was she sent the books before the end wow. to my aunt in California to have them rebound because they were falling apart so that I could have them when I graduate. Wow. So there definitely are events where like I tucked them in, but that was sort of like, I know my family's history. Right. You know, I can, I can go back to the family farms. I've got pictures of all, you know, when photography started, right. And I've got mm -hmm. pictures from the 1850s and sixties of the, the properties. And so I think I've always had that interest in like the, the, where do you come from? And then, you know, the little, you know, uh, like so many of our friends, you know, I liked theater and performing arts. So it was kind of the, those two things of like, you're, you're in history and there's a quote and, uh, very embarrassed to say I can't remember who it is, but I literally have it up on my dresser upstairs and says history at its best is vicarious experience. And that sort of became my thing. 
And so when I was 12, I started doing all that research. And by the time I was 13, and of course, um, you know this, for anyone who doesn't know me personally, I'm six foot six. Uh, and so by the time I was 13, I was almost six foot tall. So no one looked at me and said, is this guy old enough to, you know, right. and, um, and even it was funny because my father had taken me out when I was younger to give me the like, this is how you use a firearm safely. Mm-hmm. And I ended up with my first firearm and my grandmother, my maternal grandmother, who was living with us at the time, who's it's the Uncle Tom's cabin she gave me. She took me out with the Mississippi rifle and she said, I just want to make sure you know what you're doing. And so <laughs> I kind of had all these people in my family that were like, you should go do this. You should go do this. Mm-hmm. Um, I got wicked lucky in uh, Syracuse, New York, actually in Liverpool. There's a museum and it's it's in sort of a limbo. And, and I really hope the Haudenosaunee and, and the, the people, the Onondaga Nation are able to do um, do great things with it. And they've already started to do a lot with it. Um, but St. Mary Among the Iroquois, and it's a recreation of a Jesuit mission. And I remember it was it was it was field trip fodder. When you were a kid, you went on a field trip to uh, St. Marie, right? Mm-hmm. And then it, you know, in the the late 90s wave of like, what can we afford, you know, cutting down county budgets, it, it got shut down. And when I was, I think it was going into my senior year, maybe it was my that, like, winter, my junior year, they brought it back. And they said, we're going to open up. It's all going to be volunteers. And I looked at my parents. It's like, I need to do community service hours to graduate. My parents like, this is a great thing for you to go and do. And so I got grassroots. There was a guy, um, uh, John Yanyost, who uh, uh, I think he's on Daga. um, But he was actually getting his PhD in museum studies at Syracuse University. This uh, older, non-traditional student. I mean, you know about non-traditional college students, don't you, John? Yeah, I, uh, I was one. Yeah. He, 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 he had a lot more gray than you've got, brother. But he was <laughs> great because he took me in and did everything like, why did we do this? Like from a very technical museum field. And that was sort of like, oh, man, maybe museums is where I can go at. Mm-hmm. So I did all that, went to Syracuse University. I, you know, I thought I wanted to do pre-law started loving my history courses more and I had someone say to me well what about a museum and the first summer in college I could go back do work at St. Marie volunteer at St. Marie and then everyone said well what about this what about that and then I end up at George Washington's uh, Mount Vernon working in the grist mill and distillery one summer for an internship and then I ended up instead of studying abroad I actually came down here and went to Gettysburg College for a semester Mm-hmm. doing a study in the Civil War internship at the Schreiber House and doing some archaeological work with the National Park. And uh, then after that, I got an internship at uh, Harper's Ferry. And it was just, it kind of, it, it was a really interesting progression. Tragically, 2010 was what it was for the hiring field and, and sort of the, the health of museums and their ability to hire young people. Mm-hmm. Um, and I mean, you and I, I mean, how many stories could we come up with of friends that we had that in that era were trying to get into museum fields and some made it, but some ended up kind of flaming out. Right. And um, so I just, I was like, all right, uh, there was a great guy from uh, college, the, an alumni at Syracuse, Winston Fisher, who he said, he said to me, like, remember there's vocations and avocations and like, maybe your avocation is where your passion is. And so that's when it's like, all right, I'm going to do interpretive stuff. I've done all this. I've made some connections with the National Park Service. So when things come up, let me just, you know, get involved. I, I had become in the reenacting world. I'd become sort of a, a gun for hire. I wasn't like, you know, any leadership position in any unit. I just kind of showed up. Uh, I, I have tried to uh, build a reputation that if I'm there, it's going to be a good time. Or if I'm going, I intend to have a good time where I'm going. Uh, and so that that's hopefully the cult of personality I've grown. Um, yeah. But it, it, it was something that, okay, I've done all this academic work. I'm not going to go in that direction anymore. But I can still do all of that. And there's still a lot of value and need to apply that and be able to move it somewhere Mm -hmm. so that it's useful. Right. So you've had all that background with public historians working in volunteer stuff and all that with, with the park service. So it has to be pretty easy for you to reach out and say, Hey, you know, this program would be really cool to do because I'm thinking of the first time I really actually met you was at the 147th New York gig at Gettysburg uh, when you came across with almost heat exhaustion 
And I'm the, and the old, uh, the old line Lieutenant in me is like, get all your traps off, get cooled off all this stuff. I remember Ranger Chris Gwynn standing there and watching me like, who is this guy? Cause Chris didn't know me yet either. Really? Yeah. yeah. So none of you, you didn't know me. And I'm like, okay, this guy's going down from the heat. Like everybody else was. And I'm just like, I got to help this guy. And that was the first time I think I met you like in person. And uh, that was, that was uh, just to, to the brief reminiscence of that moment, my memory of it. We knew it was hot. I'd have to look it up. I, I post it somewhere on Facebook. I think it was 27 or 28 degrees hotter on July 1st, 2018. That was July 1st, 1863. Wow. And we were nowhere near in shape. <laughs> so it's, like, it's much prep. And so what we did was we'd stopped all these points, but the last point, one of the seasonal guys, Jared Foos, who's now up in Lexington. Um, he's uh, his girlfriend uh, right out of college, got the dream job at Faneuil Hall. Oh, and he's, he, 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 I think he went to school in West Virginia. I don't know if he's a West Virginian, but I was like, so you're going to move to New England? You move? No, no, no. But anyway, anyway, so Jared and I hadn't stopped at the last stop. When everyone stopped at the seminary, we're like, we need to book over so Chris knows we're there. Right. And it was you, and I don't know if you remember, there's another guy, Pete Smith, who's an old Columbia Rifles guy, and his oh, son yeah. is actually in the ranks. And he looked at me, and he, because he, you know, has all the, that knowledge of how we do things, and he's just like, where are your car keys? I said, they're in my knapsack. And he's like, their knapsack's going in my truck, and you can pick it up after. <laughs> You're not carrying it around anymore. Yeah. But, you know, I think the, the, the really cool thing that precipitated all of that and, and when I think about this alliance thing, and I want to be very careful, I think there's a bit of my natural personality, there's a bit of the way I was raised, but there's a bit of that networking that I learned because I was a college student, not just a history person, but just like a college student, mm -hmm. that, you know, when I first ran into Jared Foos some time ago, it was just like, this is a guy I want to keep tabs on. Like, I didn't give you acknowledgement like, okay, this is John Heckman who's walked over and saving my skin. But when you walked over, I'm like, oh, God, all right, John Heckman's going to watch me. I hope he's not live streaming this because I look <laughs> like a turd. Um, <laughs> but anyway, uh, it, it really was something that I was like, all right. And so Jared and I just, we always spitball. And then the same networking being now senior assistant director of admissions at the college, I was doing some program and Chris Gwynn was a big speaker. And I'm like, I wonder if I could just send this guy an email as a Gettysburg person. I've heard about the Gettysburg network, you know, out on the battlefield with Steve on Sunday. And all of a sudden a guy jogging along in a yellow shirt, that big Carmichael smile on his face. It's like, oh, there he is. Just going to come up and say hello. Yeah. So yeah. it's it's one of these things. I just had been in touch with Jared and we kind of just spitball off each other. But I agree. We've fostered those relationships over enough years that people just reach out and say, or people have their own people that I'm going to go reach out to them because I know what they're going to do. Mm -hmm. And it's I think that's what's made it work. You know, when when we look at what's been going on as far as because everyone, it's always numbers. It's always numbers. Right. The blessing, too, for us, any of us who know, we're probably talking about at most 200 guys because that's going to be about the black powder cap for any national park program. Mm -hmm. We can come up with 200 guys. Well, then 200 guys, the other 100 or whatever that would have loved to go, but now it starts generating this interest and in like, well, I'm going to do my thing and, and we can work from there. But yeah, that 147 thing literally started off as Jared and I going back and forth uh, about what, what would be the coolest thing we could do, you know, in that, in that way that all, I mean, I, I wasn't, I guess I wasn't that young. I think I was, well, I've been 30 in 20, 2018, but oh, yeah, as right. younger reenactors, well, I, I know, I know. Sorry, John. Sorry. <laughs> but you know, as, as younger reenactors, we all sit around like, oh, wouldn't it be cool if we could, right. you know, march, I don't know, march up from Andersonville like we'd escaped. <laughs> I don't know. But you come up with those ideas and it was just like, hey, what if we picked a unit that fought, that we know fought all three days of the Battle of Gettysburg and literally followed them step by step? And it, it was a multi-day interpretive program. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's like, yeah, I'm, you know, 
we we'd have to see what we could do but wouldn't that be cool and that just kind of rolled mm -hmm. and yeah it, it it's it is knowing the people but it's also sort of cultivating that respect i think and sometimes this is this is some of the territory that i, I don't want to step on any toes but sometimes i think it, it it comes with a little bit of that pedigree right like someone could look at if someone asked for my resume be the weirdest like hey i want to do an event yeah send me your resume your cv right if someone looked at that and looked at my resume and really wanted to know me they could call stan mcgee and melinda day down at harper's ferry and say hey alex stowe wants to do a program what do you know about that guy and i think i left on good enough terms that they <laughs> that they you know by successfully complete my internship but you know i think right. some of that does make it easier but then also we can be those enablers that's like look i can bring all these guys and they're going to do what you want them to do they're going to do something that you will be proud to say the park sponsored this program but i it's a little bit of culpability not to be the facilitators but to understand when that's a thing like there are people that are naturally going to walk into that situation and say i can organize this mm -hmm. and even if i can't tell you the number of events over the years my line of work uh i mean you and i've talked about this how much i travel that you know don't plan on me at a reenactment in september october until rem day because right. i'm i'm in new england working so you know, I can't tell you the number of events I've organized and then say, okay, this is the officer, look for them and you guys have a great event, you know, yeah. but yeah. it's being able to be like, I know that I can put my name out there, call someone and it's like, oh yeah, this guy, let's, yeah, let's do that. I found that, and I've talked with Pete Carmichael about this and I've talked with some other people about it. And I think from an interpretive standpoint, it's a very important point to make. Uh, we don't see this level at least from what I see, we don't see the level of collaborative efforts in many other places in the country than we do at Gettysburg because of the fact that you have a great uh, chief of interpretation at the park with Chris, Gwen, you have you have great academics like like Pete and, and everyone he brings along with him to, to help out. And then you have great interpreters who are nearby because everyone comes to Gettysburg to do interpretation. And so you're going to get this it's like a, a, it's a pilgrimage for a lot of people. And when you guys did, for example, the 147th New York event, it was actually on the anniversary too. And so you got to walk the field on the anniversary and, you, and the, the crowd loved it because this is the time these guys would have been running up here. And this is the time they've been marching on the field. And uh, you gotta, you gotta, it, I, I think that would have to be really cool. Cause I was seeing it from a spectator's point of view because I don't do that anymore. Uh, I'm retired. Um, but because I've seen it from the other side so much. It's like planning all that stuff and getting all those channels to work together as one and then seeing it come to life. Tell everyone what that's like from the interpreter's standpoint of like, okay, we're here. It's going to start to go now. You know, um, I don't want to fast forward to the end, but Steve was reminding me of it. And, and almost everyone who made the whole march and did the whole event uh, remembers one thing. And uh, Eisenhower believed great leadership was to accomplish great things and give all the credit to your subordinates, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And I've watched so many, I've, some of my favorite events I've ever done that everyone lines up at the end and, and the, whoever has got the biggest straps on the shoulders is like, look, this guy cooked for all of us. That it was all that stuff. And I was trying when we were all there because I, I knew we were all exhausted and any hope of doing a program that afternoon was shot. It's right. like whoever can rally to the campsite for the evening and then we'll work our way to Culp's Hill at some point tomorrow morning. Yeah. Um, I couldn't. I couldn't string words together. I literally was sobbing because it was just like, I can't believe we pulled this off. I can't believe we pulled this off. I couldn't believe we were here. I mean, I definitely exhausted, you know, that, that didn't uh, help the emotional state. But I think it was one of these things starts with that Facebook message. Like Jared, if you want to do this, there's a handful of units. They're mostly the first core, right? Mm -hmm. And realistically the two that everyone's going to be able to read accounts about one's the 14th Brooklyn and one's the 147th New York. Do you think we can get a hundred guys to get that uniform? To look right and do the 14th brooklyn okay so what we're really talking about is the 147th new york 
Mm-hmm. And then just like, I'm, I'm going to talk to Chris and then Chris and I opened the channel. And, uh, as you and I have gone to this particular wonderful establishment, wait, if we make, if we make plugs, I think they're open like for takeout, the ugly mug cafe. Uh, I think they're open for takeout. Yeah. Yeah. Go everyone go the, if you're in Gettysburg right now, yeah. go the ugly mug cafe. Well, they're probably close, but you know, when they're open, <laughs> uh, good food. Um, don't get a nitro coffee in the large size. If you haven't eaten anything all day, that was a bad experience. But like I met Chris there and like Chris is like, okay, let's, let's do this. Mm-hmm. And you get through people and you just know the people to bring around you who are serious. Mm-hmm. Like who's going to come and who wants to be there. Mm-hmm. And I think, I think most of that event, most of that event came down to the fact that they knew at the right moment on the first, you know, unfortunately I tried to, it was like, Chris, there won't be any trains out there. We can run across the railroad tracks wicked quick and just pretend we didn't do it. And he's like, no, <laughs> except for run across the railroad tracks. Yeah. Um, you know, we can be in line. We can, you know, we can be doing all this stuff and it's, it's history at its best is vicarious experience. And so I think, for a lot, it's a cool thing because you can meet a lot of people's needs. You know, there's a definite interest within the hobby and education and interpretation. Mm-hmm. There's a definite um, interest in the hobby with immersive experiences. And often those two things are difficult to bring together. When they do come together, it's awesome, right? Yeah. When the public comes out, I look at all those videos from the 5th New York Heavy Artillery Program down in the Shenandoah and the public comes out and they're already doing drill, but they were doing drill long before the public showed up. And it's like, see, that's the, you know, you can kind of sprinkle people in and it doesn't ruin anyone's time. And, you know, they can all, you can, you can, excuse me, manage a lot of objectives at the same time. Mm-hmm. And I think in a different way, that's kind of what the 147th did was it brought people together who are like, I want to do an event during the Gettysburg anniversary. Um, it's not worth mentioning because it would open a whole other can of worms, but there are feelings about the national event, uh, the, the, you know, mm-hmm. um, so, and then we've got people who are like, I want to experience what it was like to get up, pack up, march across the road, then cut cross lots at the Kadori farm over to the other Ridge, then run up that Ridge until you're like, okay, well they're there. So get out and, you know, the cavalry has been fighting for a couple hours already. What the heck was I doing? Um, but it, it just, it worked, I think because you could want a different thing from it and it was still okay to be there. You weren't like, oh, this is going to be lame because, you know, people are going to be doing this, that or the other. No, like people saw that they could get and give a lot. That's the other thing that I think has, has made other parks more now. And, and I'm speaking about civil war sites. I can't speak of course to, to other eras. But I mean, the number of parks that are doing programs that they're like, okay, we can model this, you know, or, or, or beat it. You know, I did a program uh, with Scott Buffington that was this uh, conglomeration of a bunch of different, both on the federal and Confederate side, but we did the mule shoe and we didn't just do the mule shoe. We did the mule shoe firing. Like we broke, there were, it was like opposition. I'm like, I don't know how the heck this meets park protocol, but I'm freaking glad I'm here for it. But like, okay, like everyone's looking like, how can we push the boundary, you know, further? Mm -hmm. And yeah, I think that's, that's just the culture now. That's what people are looking for now. And as there's more faith that guys are going to show up and do something that is helpful to the park and it will help. I I wonder, I'd love your thought on this. I know you're interviewing me. I apologize. No, we have a discussion. Go on. Uh, (laughs) <laughs> like, what do you think about this idea? I, I always got the sense as a younger person, like in college, when people were talking about national park programs, mm-hmm. that there was a concern. I don't know its significance in like the, you know, the hierarchy of their concerns, but there's a concern that any reenactors that were coming were selfish, that they were just there for their own high and what they were getting off the event. And I feel that has changed. Do you agree with that or? Yeah, uh, I would say that. 20 years ago, even 15 years ago, there was still this divide between public historians and interpreters and or reenactors where uh, it was almost like 
<clears throat> there was a feeling that if your reenactment organization was coming to Gettysburg or Antietam to do a living history, it was a recruitment drive kind of thing. Like it's, it's, it's for us to beef up our numbers. Maybe we'll get two visitors to join up. And I remember being in the organizations and people talking about that freely. We're going to go to Pitzer Woods at Gettysburg and we might pick up three new people. And it wasn't about what we talk about now. We're, we're talking about really deeper stuff now. And we're, and we're not even, I hate to say it, but we're not even participating in the same type of living histories anymore. Yeah. Uh, when, when we, when we would participate uh, it started to be more like these programs. And I think the wall has come down as far as public historians and interpreters, because good interpreters have come out and said, we want to help you do something different. And um, <clears throat> it's why some, I've, I've had a lot of reenactors and public historians come to me because they're like, you're a dreamer. What do you think of doing this? And I'm like, I think that'd work if you talk to this person, this person, this person. Yeah. And it's kind of like they come to me as like the fixer. And they're like, okay, who do I contact at Gettysburg to do this? Okay, you contact this person. And I well, think and so, that's the new mindset though, uh, Alex, where people just want to have it's not about going out and doing the same old firing demo. It's about going out and showcasing to the people who are going to be there anyway, uh, on these tours, hey, this is what this would have looked like. And this is how powerful of a moment this can be for not only you, but for us as well. So it's, I think it's becoming less about um, ego with mm -hmm. in the reenactment hobby and more. And, and I'm, I'm going to put it out there because I know what, I know what was said in unit meetings and I know yeah. there's, there's, there was ego involved. There was stuff like how many recruits can we get and how much publicity can we get? Um, I'm starting to see now more of how can we give back? And how can we do something for this park that's helped us for 15 years or 20 years with interpretation? So I see that at Gettysburg and, and other parks um, with you guys. I don't know if you see it that way because I haven't, I haven't been in a unit meeting for five, six years. So I'm, I'm kind of on the outside looking in, but I remember what it, it was like uh, back in the day, you know? Uh, well, um uh I'll, I'll admit to you the last unit meeting I, they say keep holding unit meetings while i'm up in new england on work so i haven't been to one either i i did go to one and, and uh oh i feel embarrassed admitting this to you john but i was wicked hungover when i went to that unit meeting uh so i vaguely right. remember it was uh it was someone gave me an attaboy for the 147th event and i was just like ah, a lot of people were involved like thanks <laughs> So, right. so, you know, I, I don't know. I, I hear some of that. I'm with you, though, when it comes down. And, and I think that's been an easy quantifier or, or an easy differentiator mm -hmm. is to say, like, there's a group and, and it's as much as people don't want to hear this, do want to hear this. Right. I know this is somewhat hot, hot topic. Because people are doing different things. They're doing, they're redoing old things. They're doing things that, you know, it's sort of a, we could only go so far and now we're going to go all the way or, or what have you with authenticity or how, how exact it's going to be or, or how close to the actual footsteps it was going to be. I remember I was talking to someone when, when the whole thing about doing the, the Irish Brigade came up for the program this summer in August. Uh, shameless plug. Um, I had done, I was young. Uh, I had done a program, I think when I looked it up, I might have been 16, but I did a program at Antietam, and it was an Irish Brigade program, and I, I almost want to say it was the 88th New York as well, that was the, the unit, and we were doing like four full companies, so I mean, this was like no black powder, no caps, over 200, just because, you know, the Irish Brigade at that time, those regiments were still massive, you know. Yeah, yeah. So I think it was over 200 guys. Everyone got, they did the whole card thing, but they did, it was a, the coolest thing. It was so awesome. They did a card and then they did, uh, there was a time on it. And there was an officer with his pocket watch. And I thought I knew who it was. And I asked him, I said, was this you? And, and he was like, no, it wasn't me. But it was an officer with a pocket watch mm -hmm. and he was calling out the time. And then guys would kneel when that time was called. And the card wasn't, they weren't supposed, you know, it would say like lost a leg, caught, cut in half with a cannon shell. They weren't, you know, doing the grimacing. It was, it was the park, right? They weren't portraying casualties, but the key was everyone kept dressing in. And once we finally made it to the bloody lane, 
we turned around and I'm literally getting goosebumps. Just think about it. We turned around and looked back at all these guys kneeling. And it's like, this is the casualties from four companies. They were not the first ones to make the assault, you know, against this lane. So, you know, just kind of do that. And it wasn't that there's, you know, everyone camps at the Dunker church. You do this, that, and the other thing. It's like, no, we're going to do this. Like, this is, this is what it should be. And I think the, the truth is all people, all people in all constituencies, the park, the interpreters, the visitors, they want that authenticity. A firing demonstration looks cool, but it's usually pretty stilted and, you know, and wheel left, fire, wheel right, fire, right file, you know. Mm -hmm. um, but this, you know, when you're like, it's this is, you're seeing what you're seeing, right? With the 147th event, so many people said when Scott brought the battalion out of the line into the field and coming up to everyone, everyone got a, you know, a sense. You know, Chris was mentioning, you know, this is what you're seeing. I think... I think we were less than a third of the regiment. We might have been about a quarter of what the 147th actually was to stay within the the, um, the black powder cap. Mm -hmm. But, you know, they're like, this is one regiment. This is how many regiments are coming to the field right now. You know, so the, you're seeing a fraction of this and it just, it gives that monumental, like, what am I seeing? Right. And ev everyone benefits from that, right? The reenactors love the youtube video where they're like oh look that's me right and in that having that experience and that story to tell the public loves it because they they are smarter than i think a lot of people give them credit for and the park loves it because they they see so much come out of it you know mm -hmm. 147th program happens 15th alabama program happens mm -hmm. Irish Brigade program happens. And then, and I knew, I, I didn't know this was happening, but now, you know, uh, the, there are people who are going to be doing something huge. It's the Liberty Rifles are going to basically be taking over and doing a bunch of stuff on the park next year for the anniversary. And it's like, this is the progression, you know, because, you know, we've all been, we've all been constituent parts of this, right? I'm, I belong to the Liberty Rifles. I'm the uh, adjutant of 3rd Battalion USV. Yeah. Um, you know, we all kind of run in the same circle, but this is the progression. Mm -hmm. And as more and more people see, this is the way people want it to be, spectators, interpreters, so on. I think this is, this is just the way it goes. Yeah. Uh, really good question from uh, Andrea Lee Pike on Facebook. She says, do you keep a diary when you do the events? I did. I used to, I used to, and I was actually at a very, uh, a very small event in a very different era. And, uh, it's, it's sort of, I got, I got wicked self-conscious, which is weird to say because my sport of choice was rowing. So there's gotta be pictures all over there in the world of me and spandex. So I don't know what Man. I'm worried about. Six, six and rowing. Wow. Oh, oh yeah, dude. I used to be able, I used to be able to leg press, like over 600 pounds, like rep after rep after rep. My famous trick was uh, in the in the gym at Syracuse University. There's this thing called a three stroke watt test, which you take your you build up to your hardest stroke. I sheared an erg in half. I literally sheared the aluminum because I torqued it so hard. And oh. the coach was like, "You don't need to do that again." It's like, thanks, Marshall. <laughs> um, so I kept a diary and then someone I was at, so it was, we were doing, um, we were actually, we were doing, uh, the fifth ranger battalion. We're up at Fort Niagara because the, the construction of Fort Niagara, actually those block houses look almost identical to the forts and fortifications in Brittany and Brest, um, which the fifth was part of task force sugar. So we set up, we, you know, have a full rifle platoon and we'd set up. And so I had a, you know, Remington typewriter. I was just typing. The woman's like, why are you typing? And I said, diary. And she looked at me like I had, like I had coronavirus. She looked at me like I was the weirdest dude she'd ever met for keeping a diary. And, and something about that, I, I've always had to back and forth. You know, I love immersive events, but then I come back and I'm like, was I just like playing cowboy, you know, out there in a way. So that, that's my own personal thing. I do. Um, there was a, there's a great dude, uh, Mark Schaffner, um, who w was for, it still is. I mean, I'd still go to him for like, he's the civil war paperwork guy. 
Like if you want to know, he's a great source for like, hey, there's this form, what goes in X column? He's yep. a great guy that's got that knowledge. Yep. And he always did these extensive AARs uh, after action reports. And he would he would do that. So I do a little bit of it. But also events like that, like I wasn't so much crying <laughs> at the end of the 147 because of the experience I had. I was crying because I couldn't believe a hundred some odd guys had stuck with me in this heat to do a program that at times, because it always feels this way in a group project that you're the only one doing the work, right? Right. And so it's like, if, if this guy was running the event, we'd be doing the 56 Pennsylvania. If that guy was doing the event, we'd be doing an Iron Brigade. You know what I mean? Yep. And so it's like, these guys have literally followed me on this thing that Jared Foos and I have put together. I just remember Chris Gwynn came over and I don't think he threw his arm around me because I was probably way too sweaty, but he's just like, he's like, dude, like I owe you a drink. And he's like, do you, do you want to do anything this afternoon? I'm like, I don't think I can ask them to do anything else. He's like, fair mm -hmm. enough, man. We'll see you tonight. And so it was just one of those things that it's like, um, I, there are a lot of pictures of me reenacting on the internet. I don't, you know, I've got vanity and ego as much as anyone else, but I really desperately try not to take pictures at events. I desperately try to like, there were other people will document, like there's something to just experiencing that. And then I have the benefit that it automatically keys memories of, you know, this guy's journal or that guy's letter home. And it's like, this is what he's talking about. Mm -hmm. You know, some, when I think it was, uh, I think it was into the piney woods was this event. It was a long marching event. And I had a pair of brogans that didn't really fit right. And one of the guys said, well, you could try cutting the slits in your brogans. And my parents had bought it for me on my birth for my birthday. And I'm like, well, you know, you can always ask for forgiveness. So I did, I cut and fixed it. I wore those, I wore those brogans till the, till they fell apart. Um, but it was just one of those, like that moment isn't like, oh, like I do have the, I remember doing this and that and the other, but uh, it's more of like, this is what that guy was talking about. And then you can have that moment where it's like, here's a Brogan. Why did I cut it up? Let me explain to you. Like, where does this come from? You know? Mm -hmm. uh, have you ever attended the National Council for Public History at all? No, you know, I actually, that that is a failing of mine. Um, there, I so I joined. Uh, God bless my mother. I joined a group called ALFAM, which is the Association of Living History, Farming, and Agriculture Museums. Yeah, I'm upstate New Yorker. Um, the Farmers Museum in Cooperstown, very near and dear to my heart. It's actually the church at the Farmers Museum is where my wife and I got married. Um, so you know that I, I sort of kind of kept in in that. I'd be I'd be interested in going because I think even in my job now with what I do with admissions, it's actually interpreting, you know, you're taking this big, like, what is college? What is college that now costs 70 grand a year? Right. Mm -hmm. And like trying to explain these things, I think it's more that problem solving is intriguing to me. So in the same way, going to a conference like that, I think would be intriguing just for the overall, like, how are we talking about these things? You can do it in a, in a granular way. Like how do we talk about slavery? Mm -hmm. uh, but you can also do it in the broader ways of just like, how, how do you try to reach people, you know, where we are, we will, you know, we will be riding this wave. I mean, God willing, you know, I know none of us were happy to see the, the, uh, the news out of mystic seaport. Right. Right. And, you know, things rebound. We'll still be talking about what's the impact of this. You know, hopefully this is, I, I feel bad to use this analogy, but hopefully we've, we're a rubber band. And as soon as everything's let go, people are just like, I want to go outside. I want to go do this. I want to take my family here. Like we can't go to Cancun anymore. I guess you, what Cancun's a weird family vacation. Well, yeah. <laughs> we can't go wherever. Yeah. yeah. I don't have kids. I don't know where you take them. <laughs> Disney, right? I just went to Disney for the first time myself. Take your kids. Um, yeah. But anyway, uh, I'm hoping that bounces back, but that would be the interpretive tool of like, you know, we've just gone through this time and like, we don't think about yellow fever, you know, and all these different things that people were like, stay inside. I don't trust anybody, mm -hmm. you know, like there's good Christendom and you know, the, those values and what have you, the, the community and the, the church is the heartbeat of it. But, you know, it's not worth your kids dying of cholera, you know? So I think that will be an interesting tool for the right places that can discuss it. Um, 
you know, I, I, I always think of like the, you know, museum, the national museum of medicine, you know, down uh, in the district or, or the, um, Oh no, John, John Frederick. What is that? Oh, the medical museum, the civil war. Medical museum. The civil war medical museum. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I could see the facade. National Museum of Civil War Medicine. Yeah, that one. Yeah, I'm a bad person. I'm officially going to get. Right, shout out to them too. Uh, they're going to be, you know, they're on there a lot now doing live streams. I see, I see them on there talking about stuff that's pertinent to, to what we're going through today and all that. But, but I mean, that's that's just, you know something like that was what I liked about to go back to St. Mary among the Iroquois was like when people would come out and there were little little things we could talk about, right? Mm-hmm. The building whenever where everyone slept was called the dortoir because it's to sleep, right? Dormir is to sleep. That's where we get the word dormitory from. And so it's like little things like that that you could like help connect people with. Right. 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 We now have this connecting connection to vastly under, not under discussed necessarily, but just not discussed different parts of like, what was it like to live in America? Um, that, okay, now that, that door is open. Right. Um, Garrett Coast has two questions. Oh, God. Okay, first of all, my, okay, I tell him I will answer one, then ask him one, then answer the other one. All right, first question. What yeah. res- this, these are great. What, what responsibility do individual interpreters have when presenting information to the public? Fantastic question. Ooh. Well, I think that's, that's, the, that's the joke, right? Like, Garrett's been there. I've definitely made that out loud. Like, the scariest part of reenacting is the other people you're reenacting with, right? Like the, the scariest part of interpreting is the other people that you're hearing the stories come from. Mm-hmm. And this is, I'm, I'm you know, I've, I've, I've hemmed and hawed as I've thought about this today. So I'm going to plant my foot squarely in my mouth. There's a great democracy to living history and interpretation, right? I think uh, we don't talk about anymore. But what was the, the historian's name? De La Fantasy. Um, was he the guy that wrote that article slagging off on reenactors and basically saying, you know, they're useless and they destroy the entirety uh, of history. Yeah, and... I don't even remember his name because it doesn't really matter. <laughs> Sorry. So, but, but here's what, here's what's wrong. <laughs> you know, this, this is, and this is true. And look, right. I've known many people from many walks of life. My mentor in the hobby, God rest him, uh, was a nuclear engineer that the only reason he, uh, that I got the sense Mr. Hauser ended up working in a nuclear power plant was because of what he did in the Navy. Like, Right. I'm, I'm, I'm not saying there's a superiority to people with college education, but I think this goes back to if you can network, that's your responsibility f- to facilitate. But then the individual interpreter is like, it's the same as to, to put it in a simple. <laughs> Sorry, Brendan Benner's been reading Killer Angels. Now I'm just seeing Kemper around, you know, like a gentleman's club. Yeah. Right. If a friend of yours invites you to a party, you behave as if you're that person's friend. Because if not, then that person is going to say, why did you invite them? So I almost think, and that is so superficial, so I apologize, but I think at the base level, that is the the individual, like you have to think of how you represent yourself. Mm -hmm. And honestly, if someone is like, I don't think about that at all, then probably, you're this if you find yourself on the outside of things that may be why like i i have have a good buddy who i like him he's enthusiastic but like his deal is like you don't think about who you're like what you're doing when you're out there you just want to play dress up Mm -hmm. and i feel like if you're an interpreter there's going to be some accountability and i mean i i think unfortunately the accountability only really hits when someone puts you on blast. You know, if you're really wrong yeah. and someone brings you up and so, you know, another privilege of mine is I'm huge. If I, if, you know, um, Cheney, uh, Cheney McKnight and Lindsay Foster, once we're up in Gettysburg and we're talking about something and they started talking about slavery. And I, I don't know if I, I, I gave some involuntary response, my bad. Cause I was just hanging on the weekend. It was my one weekend. I was not recruiting in new England and one or both of them looked at me and said, you need to eat your vegetables. And it was, it was an interesting thought. Sadly, not as long ago as I would like this conversation to have been, but it's like, you know what? No one's going to stop me. If I want to stand up and say, look, if we're going to ignore slavery as part of the situation here, like someone's gonna, you know, no one's gonna come up and physically intimidate me. 
You know what I mean? So maybe it is my responsibility because I know I'm not going to get harassed for it. Or if I am, I'm not going to care who's harassing me, mm-hmm. you know, then maybe it is an, a responsibility to do it. But I think the problem, the problem is you, you kind of go just to the social club rules. Like you need to, when you're doing these things, you, you should at the very least think of like, who are the other people around me? And if you're by yourself, well, then, you know, who, who might someone else be like, okay, there's no more programs, interpretive programs with volunteers allowed at this park. Why? Because of this one person, Yep. you know, and then everyone else is going to come back to you and be like, way to go, man. Now there's no more park, no more programs at this park because you went and acted the fool. So, yeah. Yeah. so my, my rebuttal to Garrett cost is, have you done your homework? Mm. We'll find There's, out when he comments. Yeah, we'll find out what was his what was his second question? His second question was how should park service personnel monitor members of reenacting groups to portray history accurately and in a positive light? So, I might have to pose that to Chris Gwynn when I talk to him too. I might have to keep that question yeah, aside. I can ask you, but I mean I think that's a great question for Chris Gwynn as yeah, well. I'd love I'd love to hear the Godfather's opinion on that, man. Yeah, the uh, silver fox. I, I think uh right. Like if I'm gonna go gray, I want to do it like Chris Gwynn. I'm just throwing Chris Gwynn gray. Just throwing that out there. Yeah, that's a just all the shameless plugs tonight. I want to go gray like Chris Gwynn. Someone make that a t-shirt. That's a that's a just for men color. Chris Gwynn gray. Chris (laughs) Gwynn gray. So here's here's what I'm gonna say, and there are places doing it better. And actually, the the really interesting person to pose that question to would be Jared Foos, where he's up at Minuteman. Because Minuteman, and and I say this among the living history circles, made a lot of waves because they came out with this interpretive like handbook that if in a binder, it'd be like a three inch binder. I mean, they, there's all the things that we sort of expect as, you know, seeing authenticity, uh, uh, uniform and equipment requirement lists for different events. And they go into all that granular detail, but they have some more of it, excuse me as well. I think the other difficult thing, and Gettysburg may, may indeed be a lightning rod for this, because Gettysburg is the place we all know, and I'm not shaming anyone for doing this, because I know what I was doing on the battlefield yesterday, so, but is the place where random people show up in a Civil War uniform, right? Mm-hmm. And so, you know, anyone can ask you anything, and your response will basically be taken as if you're an employee of the federal government. Right. Because, oh, here's this person in a federal in a in a well, not necessarily federal, but in, a, in a, a uniform of the Civil War era right. answering questions. Therefore, they are a person who's supposed to be here. And so, you know, I don't know. And in one hand, uh, oh, my gosh, the backlash would be if people thought the response to the new visitor center museum in comparison to the old museum was strong. If the park put out something that you could not be on the park in uniform unless you were part of an active event going on, that would be an interesting power move. Yeah. You know, unfortunately, I don't, you know, I've I've only ever met a couple people from Park Watch, so I don't know how much teeth that organization has. And Lord knows the law enforcement rangers aren't probably eagerly looking for more things to patrol after. But it would be interesting if you set that precedent what what the response would be i'm sure the initial kickback would be a free speech you know uh a- aggravation but be interesting if that if that decision was made and sort of approached from the direction of look we cannot otherwise monitor all of you right you know what what are we going to do are we going to you know give a, a miniature version of the um, licensed tour guide exam and then if you get that, you get a pin that you have to wear on your uniform. And if you're out there on the field and you don't have your pin, then you're like, I, I don't know. That's going to be way too much. But it, it'd almost be interesting to see, like, if you haven't informed us, you're going to be on the field. You can't be on the field. And if nothing else, that way, if someone comes and they're like, I just talked to a guy and he told me about the 30,000 black, you know, Confederates that fought in the Battle of Pickett's Charge. Right. Um, they could be like, hey, buddy. Don't come back. Yeah. Not going to hurt us, you know. I think I, know. I think that uh, I think that possibly what's going to happen in in future is the fact that what what you guys are creating and and other units like yourself are creating is this kind of like a vacuum where uh, 
the units have to be known to the park officials well enough to be able to be trusted with these types of programming. So it's almost like you have to run the CV of the unit and be like, well, what else have they done? Who are, what are parks have they worked with? What programming have they put on? Did they cause any problems? Did anyone get arrested? You know, yeah. and on and on and on. Or it's almost like a background check on, on some of the units now. But you starting, <coughs> excuse me, you're starting to see a lot of the units that were there 15 years ago uh, doing living histories of Pitzer Woods are not there anymore. Number one, because they've lost a lot of numbers. And number two, because they're some of them aren't welcome anymore. They've done something silly or broken a safety violation or whatever. Yeah. So that that has caused the rift between the the reenactor interpreter and and the public history end for a little while until good interpretation comes along and says, well, wait a minute, those guys were just fringe. We're yeah. trying to do it straight and narrow. Yeah. Yeah, I think it's the other difficult. So then, the, then, so then, back to Garrett's first question: If you're going to take any accountability, your accountability has to start from the point like you have to set yourself apart from the fringe, mm -hmm. right? Like that you have to start at ground zero. And so this was this was the point I was starting to go in. I think it's a it's a weird barrier to entry, but I think as the hobby in different areas has had more individuals who are college educated, not excluding those who are not, right. but I think for better or worse, that has added to a comfort level for a lot of people because it's like, okay, there's some base, there's some base level you're coming from here. Right. I mean, I had, I had a job. I loved working at this grocery store. You know, it was not the, didn't make me feel the most accomplished right out of college, but realistically they paid me 15 bucks to like hang out with people and solve problems for idiots. You know, it was kind of like, you know, I'm sorry that we don't sell that coffee in 30 pound bags. I, I don't know how to help you, but, um, but you know, being that job required me to have a bachelor's degree that was right in that was right in the description for that position. Mm. I'm not saying that we need that requirement because there's a lot of great amateur historians that like, you know, there's there's no way I would want someone to be like only someone with a, a X, Y college degree is allowed. No, that's right. dumb. Right. What I'm saying is if people want that has been an easier barrier to remove for people. You know, if you know someone who was a Gaysburg College student and went through the park and made some sort of connection, how, how quickly does that go? Or people at other parks, you know, how quickly does it go? To now that there are some of us guys that we go uh, on the way back from being down in um, uh, Williamsburg one time, my wife and I stopped in Fredericksburg and, you know, partially it's because I'm a huge looking goof, but people like, hey, Alex, how are you doing? It's like, oh my gosh. My wife's like, how do you know these people? It's like, we've all done events. Yeah. yeah. And so, but it's one of those things like, okay, now we get to the point that's like, these are people you can talk to. And I'm like, the other thing is, I really appreciate being here, John, but like, I've only ended up in this circumstance because of where I live. And honestly, somewhat because of where I work. Mm -hmm. And like, otherwise I wouldn't have an, oof. That was going to be an awful sentence to say. I'm going to rewind that one back. <laughs> like, I don't have a huge impact on the hobby, right? Like, I'm able to put on events that people enjoy. And like I said, I think most people know if I'm doing something that I expect it to be a good time. And maybe that's some sort of like, I've ha I have had people say like, oh, Alex is going to be there. So it'll be a good time. And then I'm in a bad mood and I leave the event early and they're like, something's wrong with Alex, you know, but you know, uh, but it's one of those things that if I didn't live, if I didn't live in Gaysburg for this period of my life and have been just kind of networking as I were, I don't know that you and I would have had this conversation because I don't know that from upstate New York, I would ever had encountered Jared and Chris Gwynn in the way I did. And so some of this is also just like geographic proximity. And then maybe that's what it is. If you're going to be a person who's in this area and feel strongly about the hobby, maybe that's your culpability. I would love to say that's every Gaysburg college student, because I got three guys coming in that if they were watching this tonight or they watch a recording, Mike, I want you, if you come down here, Mr. Barry, and want to get involved in reenacting. Sorry, John, I'm not talking to you. I'm talking to this young man. That's okay. It is your responsibility to say, okay, 
there's got to be a standard level and I'm going to help everyone achieve that. Not exclude people because they can't be there, but I'm going to get people there and I'm going to make that the standard because I'm here and I can afford to both, you know, time and other resources. I'm going to be that guy. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? It's weird to say, but like, you know, if I wasn't in this area, who knows? Right. Same with me. I mean, I, I grew up 25 miles from Gettysburg. So uh, my interest in history might be something completely different because I wasn't around the area. Uh, the movie came out when I started reenacting in 93. That's how old I am. And, and it was just like that, those series of events, no series of contacts through the years. But then growing up in a hobby where I heard that certain people don't want to talk to you because you're reenactor. And now everyone's talking to everybody else and you see the wall coming down the, the crumbling of it yeah. where it's like, okay, 20 years ago, we would never even talk, not you and me, but like some people that I've worked with, we've been like, Oh, they're in a different sector of, of the history field. I don't really have anything to do with them. Now you're starting to see that break down and, and uh, the internet has been the most powerful way of, of doing that. But social media has just been a huge way of doing that. And it's allowed me to come out and watch the, one of the programs that you guys are doing and live stream it out to people. And I've seen 20 other people doing the same thing at the same time. And it's allowing us to get the message out there and make it more accessible. And I think that would be one of the um, main assets of what you're trying to do as an interpreter, the 200 guys with you are trying to do as an interpreter is accessibility. There's no friction as far as you know you're not you don't have to pay to play you don't have to come out here and pay to see us do this just show up and and try or have your buddy show up and and live stream it out and we'll watch it or what you know i think i think that's where the key is now instead of paying and i hate to say it but instead of paying 40 dollars to go to reenactment and spending 150 bucks for a family come out and see 200 guys who look legit who are sponsored or not sponsored, but who are approved by the park to come out and do this event. And that's, that's more, I think, and you're standing in Herbst woods, what's was known as Reynolds woods at yeah. that time. And you're seeing this happen. God, the, the possibilities are endless with that because you have how many hundreds of units and then you have hundreds of spots and that's one battle. Uh, yeah. You could be doing that at a farm museum. You could be doing that at other things at the same time. I think that's where it is. Sometime when you when you have time, and I know you're busier than a one-legged man at butt kicking contest, John. But I'll have to send you a link to um, the Farmers Museum uh, in Cooperstown. Um, does I think they're now calling it a living history. It's more like they're they're turning it a bit more into a timeline event because that that air er, that area is really interesting. I mean, you're right across the street from James Fenimore Cooper's house. So, I mean, this is, this is the land that he envisioned the French and Indian war happening in. Right. And, and well, it, it did, I'm not taking that away, but, um, but anyway, they did the civil war event. And uh, I think I was doing the, you know, you know, you've been reenacting long enough when you're like, how can I show up and not dirty a gun? <laughs> yeah. So, uh, so they're trying to get people. And I knew um, a couple of the historic trades people at the museum um, and so I was just helping like move people back because they're going to do a sham fight through town. And da, da, da. I was just talking to people. It's like, you know, don't envision yourself in upstate New York. It's never happened in upstate New York, you know, but envision you're in an agricultural town in the Shenandoah Valley. And I kind of did this rambling interpretation. I'd love you to watch it. And it's the most off the cuff, BS improv thing you've ever seen in your life. But I couldn't believe number of people from the museum and then other i had so many people that found me on facebook and were like hey like what else do you guys do and it's like oh well okay yeah uh next year we're gonna you know and sure enough we were it was it was in the afternoon of the second when we were building the breastworks from the deadfall up on culp's hill for the 147th program Mm -hmm. um actually on the second building earthworks from the breastworks from deadfall on culp's hill it's pretty wild yeah. Um, we had this uh, couple come up and it was me and another guy that had been at the farmer's museum. He's like, Oh my God, my family saw you guys. And was like, Oh wow. You like took us seriously and brought your family on vacation. But you're right. There's that accessibility of it. Like come down and see this all, all multiple days. Right. And it, you know, if, if we can do this, you know, like Gaysburg is my home park right now, you know, but you know, uh, if I was back up home, 
it'd be Fort Stanwix uh, would be my, my home park. And I actually had family that was in the third New York line that endured the siege uh, of Fort Stanwix. So, you know, nice. who, who, who knows? I don't know. You know, people talk about, oh, were they really that tall in the Civil War? I don't know how someone's going to be like, were they that tall in the Revolutionary War? Yeah. <laughs> but, uh, but, you know, it, it's one of these things like maybe that like, yeah, Garrett, great question. But like maybe that's the accountability is like it's my home <laughs> park. Like I'm going to be a source of positive change and I'm responsible to be that. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. but yeah. uh, Andrea Lee Pike has a question and it was seconded by Amanda Lee. And it's a question that um, I get a lot and, and it's, it can be a very simple question. It can be a very complex question, but she asks, so is it reenactor living historian or interpreter? My name is Alexander Mackenzie Stowe. My brother calls me Al, Al my pal. Uh, my friends have called me Big Al, Stoey, Stoetry. Stoetry is the more recent one. Daryl Jones uh, loves Stoetry. <laughs> yeah. uh, I answer to all of them. That is a bit of pretension that I don't abide. Mm -hmm. it, because if someone's like, you know, I guess you may, unless the person is making a differentiation in their own mind. Like if I thought someone was coming up and they're calling me a reenactor to indicate some level of the professionalism they thought I would exude in that moment, then I might take, you know, uh, umbrage toward it. But um, overall, you know, everyone's got different different feelings about it. You know, until we all say we no longer want Vice News to come into our camps. Uh, which no one's going to do anytime soon. And actually, I, I think it'd be fun if Vice wants to show up to uh, the Irish Brigade program this summer and march across the wheat field with us. Knock yeah. yourselves out. Bring yeah. a good camera. We want it. We want good stills from this. Yeah. Um, but uh, I think we hold that ourselves in a different way. I also wonder, too, if some of that is born. And I definitely have had this resentment. I actually had this epiphany with my brother not long ago. I said, I needed to step back and realize, I don't know where I was ge geographically or what I'd actually accomplished in my college career. I was still applying for museum jobs long after I should have been applying. Like I should have taken enough of those no's to be like, I do not have entry into the field right now. What else can I be doing? But I still had that, you know, post-college enthusiasm with like, I have a dual degree. I've done all these internships, like I am absolutely an ideal candidate. And so I, I almost wonder if sometimes people, it puts their hair up because they think it's like a museum employee being like, you're only a volunteer, right, you know? Right, right. And this also comes from experience in the fire service that, you know, where I come from, if your house is on fire, the person showing up is not getting paid to do it, right? They're, they're, they're straight, they're straight conquered green. Like I'm here because you need me to be here. Mm -hmm. Right. And I've got the skills to be here and make something better out of this situation. Right. So if, an, if a museum is still looking at people like we don't need volunteers, then that's a whole of that that conversation. I apologize for this being so long, but that's separate of what are they calling you? That's a whole respect thing, which I think we're sort of finding within the park service isn't happening so much. As far as a member of John Q public coming up or like how I call myself. Right. It depends. If I, if like, you know, if I call myself a living historian, that may mean nothing to someone. They're like, yeah, I can see you breathing and you like history. You are a living historian. Right. You know what? Yeah. It, so I just, right. she had to follow up. If she, she confronted someone or not confront, but she had a run in with someone in a uniform. They got snippy with her about it. So I can, so I've known, I've known interpreters, reenactors like that who are like, Oh, I'm a living historian. I'm not a reenactor. It's this whole insecurity stuff with me where it's like well wait a minute <laughs> you know i i don't like insecurity and when I, I you can see it a mile away and i've met too many reenactors who don't want to be called that because they think that's belittling them or whatever else and it's like dude we're all reenactors out here we're reenacting an event or we're doing whatever but some people get really perturbed do, you know? do does everyone see this this bookcase this bookcase goes up to the ceiling which i cannot touch the ceiling with my fingertips goes across this doorway and down the other way. Now, God bless, my wife gave me more than half of it. But like, you know, I have a problem. It's an okay problem. There's worse problems to have. But, you know, if you can't, 
it's sort of like I've never picked up diarying after that woman confronted me in Niagara that one time, which I guess a bit of insecurity on my behalf, but yeah, you're absolutely right. Like we're in, we're in a realm. I think this was the other thing back to that article that the guy had written, like I said, dragging reenactors. We're in, we're in a different era where overall, I mean, it's like almost an effect of the gig economy. Like, you know, how many guys do we know that are not, they didn't go to, uh, you know, college for it, but they make great, great clothing, right? Not even just people making reproduction clothing, but like independent clothing makers that are like, this sounds like something fun to pick up. All these guys that never touched hot metals in their life, but they went to, you know, a flea market and they found a um, hand crank bellows forge pan and they said, hey, I wonder if I can do blacksmithing, you know, history is not possessive. The only time it's possessive is if it's something to your family and you don't want it out there, right? That would be the only thing. Right. But otherwise, you know, the, the whole idea that you have some limit to it, I love, go to the National Archives. I've been in the National Archives. Yes, I have a college degree. There are people in there just digging up stuff because they're doing it. There were the, One of the days I was there, it was like senior citizen day and they're all just looking up stuff that interested them like you know this one guy was looking up old maps from his hometown and so it's like okay yeah i can uh i can i can absolutely get behind this yeah. sorry my 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 wife just had sent me a text message i want to make sure that place up in new york wasn't on fire or anything but uh yeah, no, no. No, but I, but I I definitely want to get to this question before we wrap here in a minute because I want you to be able to talk to your wife because you haven't seen her in how long. Oh no no, I mean if if, if you want to, if you need to go we can go. She we're, we're actually doing okay. Uh, we talked earlier. I just making like I said. But what what's the question? No no, I I was just uh, wondering because I saw some stuff online coming up in the future and stuff, and I wondered about your idea for the future of Interp with the relationship of public historians because I see that there's even more park programming coming up this summer. So how do you feel about this going forward uh, in the future? Do you see it accelerating with the general public when you can get onto Facebook and you can say, hey, we're gonna have a 200 man battalion do this, or we're gonna have whatever else. Do you see it accelerating because of the, the networking stuff that you and so many others have created over the years? Absolutely. And I think also it's like being frank with each other. So I, I hope Chris doesn't mind. Um, I don't work for him. I don't know. I, I, I'm not trying to piss Chris Gwynn off here. Um, he and I were talking about this summer and like, what should we do this summer? You know, we did federal and we did Confederate. So let's do another federal this year. And so we're just talking about it. And, you know, we had pitched some ideas. Does, do you want to be on South End? Where should we camp? You know, what should we come up with? And, you know, then I'd pitch the idea to him, you know, if we're going to pick a unit, we know what the black powder cap is. You know, there were plenty of tiny units at the Battle of Gettysburg. Let's pick one of these units. And Grant, truthfully, there's only like a handful. Let's pick one of these units that was less than 100 guys. And that will be so that way when you're looking, people are like, this is the whole regiment. Mm -hmm. Like, we're, This isn't what it was. Like, this isn't what it started. This is what is left in July of 1863. Yeah. Uh, you know. That's to awesome. give them that real moment. But let's do this. And we we're spitballing units. And he was very honest with me, which also that part of the alliance is appreciated. Like, Alex, it would be really easy to market one of the Irish Brigade regiments. And it's like, you know what? You could not be more correct. Mm -hmm. Because I've had a guy from there's like, uh, I learned something new. There's an Irish newspaper in America called the Echo. It's like the only uh, actually, uh, Irish newspaper that it's it exists in some form back in, in Ireland, of course, but there is an American edition, uh, and one of their, uh, one of their correspondents who comes out to different events with the 69th living history association, uh, in New York city. Um, he's like, I want to write a story and we've got all this other stuff going on in the background. It's like, you know what, Chris, I absolutely see that. And so I think it's a bit of what do we want to achieve? Like, as, I'm sure as easy as it was to convince, you know, guys last year, hey, wouldn't the 15th Alabama be great to do? Some of that is also being like, you know what, Chris, that's the easiest thing for you guys. You can easily get spectators. Mm -hmm. And in a driving rainstorm, right in a driving rainstorm they got. So you look, 
the 147th program was a bit of like that raw, we're going to hit Facebook hard. They do that like coffee with a ranger. We're going to talk about this. It becomes a whole marketing plan like, like we do in admissions, like Ford Motor Company does a whole plan to it. And then the next year, it's like, okay, we're going to do the same plan, but we're going to pick a unit that people have really heard of and do that again. Like, let's, let's sit back and do this. There's plenty of opportunities for us to do stuff just for us. But I do think that's the next progression is saying and talking with people about, okay, what can we do that's iconic, right? Like, we can never do the Irish Brigade at um, Marie's Heights, right? There's because there's no Marie's Heights. I mean, they, they did the 150th, but there was I I wasn't there. I was doing a medical scenario at the Rising Sun Tavern, and I heard that there was a canvas painted, uh, canvas painted uh, stone wall that had people feeling a sort of way. Right. So we can never do that there, right? So, there, but if if a park can say, what would be an iconic thing to do? Mm-hmm. Let's find that, and and let's you know if we truly as interpreters are about this education piece, we can temper them, right? We, we can, we can go back and forth and be honest with what can we, can we not do going back to, we can do the 14th Brooklyn. We can do the 147th New York, which one are we actually going to be able to, to pull off? Right. And being honest with each other, but also saying like, Hey, this is a unit that if we do it right, we can easily market. So I see that going up. I also see because we get more excited about it. Right. So a lot of these events, the, the thing that I've really noted, and mostly from when I got older and I started, you know, when I was younger, of course, most of the events I did were in New York State, right? State parks, state historic sites, whatever. Um, as I got older and, and you're going somewhere, it's going and doing the event on the original ground. That's what the guys get really excited about. That's what interpreters want, right? So then the next step of that is I want to do it on the original ground around the time that the action actually happened. Sometimes you're lucky as we were with the 147th program and we actually did things on the first, second, and third. Sometimes you're like the 15th Alabama and it's just the weekend closest to the program, right? Right. So, um, and next year it looks like it's either going to be the weekend before or or the weekend of the anniversary. Who knows? I mean, I, I haven't, uh, Mike Clark has not asked my opinion and I've got enough going on in life. He's totally fine not to. Yeah. Yeah. And again, this goes back to like, we all, I think this is the other thing that we can benefit brief tangent mm-hmm. is like recognize like there are events people are doing that I'm just going to, I'm show up. It's going to be great. It's going to be a good time. Someone can organize it. And then I'm going to organize something else. And it's like, hey, if guys want to be involved, yeah, absolutely. We'll do, you know, we want to be part of it. You know, perfect, you know, and just realizing, I think some of the sharing, I think that's the one thing I do get concerned about is, is if people and and so far things have gone well, but um, that the danger is when someone's like, we're going to organize five, six events this year. It's like, you're gonna, you're gonna fail. Right. Um, And I think what the park needs is a mix of the models. They don't want just one group. They're always coming to and saying, Hey, can you do this? They want sort of the way it was that it's like, hey, can you do this weekend? Can you do that weekend? Can you do this? But also, I think there's been a great appreciation of guys don't want to do that firing demo anymore. If they're going to camp somewhere, like if you're going to Pitzer's Woods, do Lang's Floridians, right? Right. And like recreate Lang's Floridians. Yeah. You know, know, if you're in Pitzer's Woods, pick Lockwood's Brigade or, you know, uh, the Potomac home brigade or, you know, pick, pick a unit that was actually in that vicinity, you know, uh, at some point of the battle and and keep it that way. That was part of the reason that the Irish brigade worked so well, because there's actual suspicion and I'm not, I don't want to get into the, is it, is it true or not? But that the rock, the rock that father Corby actually gave absolution on was removed so that the Pennsylvania Memorial could be put in. And so the Pennsylvania Memorial is actually where absolution was given. And it's, it's one of the fields across the way, as it were, that was where the Irish Brigade was actually camped. So, you know, that just works out. Like, it's one of these things that it works out for us. Mm-hmm. If guys are willing to play ball and be like, all right, we need to pick someone someone has heard of at the slaughter pen farm, right? Biggest, you know, easiest piece of ground to use. Let's, let's do that. Right. Okay. Or, you know, uh, 
uh, God bless this could ever happen, but pick a unit at Saunders Field or, you know what I mean? Like you right. find these places that people have some awareness of, and then you put it out there. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think that's the way it can go. And the savvier, and, and, and this works in both halves, the savvier everyone is with social media, mm -hmm. the better, right. right? The fact that there were people with these large national reenactments that were like, why do I need to do social media marketing? And it's like, and that's part of the problem. Right. I mean, you know, yeah. there's good, bad and everything else. But mm -hmm. yeah, I, I think I think I would be I would be hard pressed to say that it's going to slow. I may I wouldn't be surprised if different constituencies get involved. But as you know, places like Lexington, Mintman, excuse me, National Park mm -hmm. have put together their huge handbook, more people get their fingers on that and do their own iteration of that. The standards become more solidified. And also too, you know, there's been conversations of like, how many people is not enough people, right? Like if you're gonna come and, and camp out and you're only bringing four people, that's not enough people. Right. So like, how do we, how do we also generate, you know, so that we've got people coming out to things in numbers that are significant as well. Right. So when is the summer event? Oh my gosh. You had to ask me that. It's, yeah, August. it's August. Uh, it's August. <laughs> I, I, screwed, I, I literally screwed this up. I was so tired when I was sending an email. I sent everyone the wrong weekend and they're like, wait, those dates don't make sense. It's the port. <laughs> it's the, cause I sent them the 16th through the 19th and they're like, it's a Sunday through a Wednesday. And I'm like, no, no, screwed that up. <laughs> it's the 14th, 15th and 16th. That's yeah. the intention right now. Nice. Um, you know, I think I'm, I'm excited. You know, it's a lot of the same people who did the 147th event, not surprisingly. Right. Um, cause we've all sort of developed this good relationship with each other, but I think it's also cool because thank you, Buster Kill Rain. You know, I think Irish participation in the American civil war is often under misunderstood. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I trust me, like people have asked, I've got no ax to grind as far as like educating America onto the Irish experience in the Civil War. That's not that's not my, you know, I've got, hold on. I've got, <laughs> I've got the right book. Hold on. Get one from the Stowe Library. The yeah. Greatest Brigade that I still have the uh, bargain bargain bin sticker on. Oh, nice. Um, but, <laughs> you know, I think it's just one of these things like it means something like right being irish in america i actually wrote a paper on this in college so i could go on a tangent but <laughs> being irish in america is about as apple pie as anything else you know and so it's it it's kind of an interesting what i would be interested in talking about would be you know what how did these guys feel about you know the army of northern virginia collecting up African Americans and taking them back south and putting them back into slavery, because right. I'm willing to bet it was not significant their right. consideration for it. Which is also an interesting, you know, these are the guys that do not give a crap. But you know, you can have that socioeconomic conversation of a lot of, you know, why why did they feel this way? Um, like I said, I wrote a paper. It's not yeah. it's not important. Are there yeah. other questions? Do you, do you want me to let you go? I, I prattled on here probably longer than I should. There's, I don't know if there's any questions yet that we didn't go over. If there are, we'll go back in the comments tonight and tomorrow and we'll go through them. But I think we covered a lot of them. We got Garrett's in. That was the most important, I guess. Yeah, yeah, Garrett. <laughs> you know, Garrett yeah. So I will, I will say this, you know, um, I think that's been the most rewarding part of being down here is interacting with these young guys. And I think that's part of the reason why I think interpretation is going in this direction. Because it's not that all of these guys are like, I'm going to be an, another park ranger. There are definitely people who do, you know, but, sure. you know, um, as long as Garrett's keeping his nose clean, you know, <laughs> yeah. he should have a commission waiting for him in the U.S. Army. And, you know, guys will go into business and all sorts of different things. But I think it's taking that lesson of like, OK, like this is cool stuff you can do. Like the one day um, last summer, we did a program with Jared Foos uh, about the 45th New York. And, you know, that was fantastic and really cool to see, 
you know, all these guys show up from the local area that we literally put out a call and said, if we can get 20 guys, you know, there's no black powder. It's, you know, I don't want anyone driving from four hours away because it's a three hour long rancher walk. And right. that's, that's it. Um, but it's still really cool to see all these guys get so excited about it. And so that's why I think this is the direction they've gone because this is what they, this is what they're learning kind of in the same way. Like when I was with like Columbia rifles guys, and, you know, a, a, a kind of an earlier iteration of the Liberty Rifles. Well, was, there's was the Liberty Rifles and the Calico Rifles and all these, these other uh, outfits. Right. You know, that's kind of why I was seeing, you know, some of my fondest memories are going down to Kernstown and doing something in oh, yeah. quote, more real time. Going, you know, going down to Antietam, going down, of course, to Gettysburg and doing a Liberty Rifles Belfield walk, going down to um, going down to a. Uh, this event at the slaughter pen farm called after the battle where we go out and it's like, what are the bodies just laying out in the field? And they had all these mannequins that they dressed up in, in army uniforms because the, that was the, the scenario for the public was like after the battle ended, like people had to go get the bodies. Mm. And then like that overnight you're slowly working because the pickets are, you know, what uh, the scenario dictated. And now all of a sudden you get to the next and you find these like three guys huddled around a fire. And it's like, wait, these guys are like actual dudes. They've literally, their whole event was showing up before any of us getting out into that hole and not doing anything like not going, not moving enough that we could see them moving mm -hmm. for a whole day. Wow. And, uh, it was, you know, it's a little weird. Uh, I think you have to be a little bit different that that's your idea of reenacting. Yeah. But on the other side, it was like, when the public saw us bring these people in, it was like, whoa, like this, you know, I will say this again and again, and again, history adds best is vicarious experience. And so I think, you know, whatever we can do to facilitate that, it's just what all constituencies want is something that feels authentic. It's something that will happen on original ground, mm -hmm. you know, when I go, you know, I, I, I don't know if we've talked about this, John, so I apologize. It's a weird, weird time to talk about. I did tell Chris, so he won't be surprised, but I'm actually moving back to New York State. Mm -hmm. And all the guys, that's all they're talking about is Fort Ontario, Fort Niagara, 7th U.S. Infantry, Muster and Endpoint, you know. Go back down to Elmira Prison. Now that they've rebuilt one of the block houses and uh, they actually reassembled an original uh, warehouse building that was part of the, the depot um, and some other structures there, like, where can we go? That's the ground in New York where things were, you know, actually happening. And it's like, okay, this is where everyone's mind is. So once you leave, everyone's going to either want to continue to Gaysburg or keep driving South and find different things to do. And so I just think that's the way we're headed. That's just what that's, that's as everyone talks with COVID, like, is this the new normal in far, as far as interpretation and in, uh, not the 147th that was a catalyst for this. Actually, if I might say it was an event, um, Tyler Greco and a bunch of guys did, um, they did a real time walk of Hayes, Louisianians. Oh yeah. I remember that. That ended up coming up cemetery Hill. And I think that kicked a lot of people like, wow, we got on this on, on July 2nd mm -hmm. or yeah, on July 2nd, mm -hmm. we got like 150 spectators to come out and watch guys hoop holler and run across the field. Yeah. But it was like, okay, now this is where programming is. And you know, I think that word has spread. And so this is just the direction it will go. Yeah. It only takes one person to be slightly more eccentric, but, <laughs> but it's all it takes. It just takes a little bit of eccentricity and the proper footnotes and, yeah. you're done. and that's it. And that's, that's the way, because that's artistic and that's like, wow, let's try this and different because you're thinking about the end product of what's this going to look like? What's this going to sound like? Yeah. And it's kind of like, you almost need an artistic mind as a historian or just as a, a reenactor to be like, what is this going to really make them feel like? And I, that's that I remember that event like it was yesterday. And I remember the 147th event. And to me personally, that has to be the direction we go because you can, the reenactments are great and all, and people get a kick out of them and everything. But I, I remember I calculated one time that in 25 years, I did over 500 events and I'm like, okay, how many more pop, pop shows you know with guns can i really do that's so much different but those those small scenarios where you have 200 guys sometimes even unit on unit those make it different than the whole thing and i really think that there's that outcry with that now especially in the, in the history field where 
public historians are really asking for these cooperative events because it brings the crowds and the academics are jumping on board because they can go out there and say, well, I wrote a book about this or I teach a course on this. So let's yeah. collaborate and do it together. I mean, the well, sky's the limit. But, I, I think, I think the nice thing in, you know, why Gettysburg is also a lightning rod for this and uh, is, is the fact that within, within the institution of Gettysburg college, there is, the Civil War Institute, which deals a lot with academic, but you know, there is more just a public history can to it. But there's so much crossover between the that academic department, the Civil War Era Studies Academic Department, and the Civil War Institute. Right. And, you know, there's so much more faculty collaboration. And then you see like, you know, the great Jim Brumall could be standing beside you at a at an event, you know. I remember the first time I met Dana Shof at an event and I'm like, I buy your magazine, you know what I mean? Yeah. And, and so I think that thing is as they and, and maybe it's young people, maybe they've just found second wind, but it's like and, and people like yourself doing this sort of work, as that revitalization comes that was what was missing when I came in. Like when I was really getting into the authentic side of doing things, the Columbia rifles had just imploded. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. And so like my inspiration to go do things was like people I kind of knew. And I, I remember I went and did something while I was interning at um, George Washington's Mount Vernon. I went and did something at Fort Ward and I literally knew no one. And there was a buddy of mine who's like, I know a guy, they'll love to see you just go hang out. And I went and I'm still on this like unit listserv of, I can't remember what it's called. I think it was like the military component of there was that Atlantic soldiers aid society or something. Oh, like that. Yeah. 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 Um, this was like the military component. Like everyone was there, but like I just showed up for this thing and it's like, all right, if this is the nature, that's why I didn't belong to a unit for so long. Mm -hmm. was like, this is the nature of doing things. I just need to know the right people. And I think that sort of is what has made the hobby successful is there were so many of us where like, it's just about knowing the right people. And I, I don't necessarily have to pay dues to someone to know that, you know, I can go there and have an impact. Right. Um, right. And, or, or even saying, you know, you, you mentioned the, you know, the small one-on-ones. The other one that I did, I can't remember, maybe Ben Jared's event, Jared Foos, I hope you're watching this. If not, like, you know, I've basically written your CV for you tonight. <laughs> yeah, uh, he, was doing, he was doing that grave digger program. And I did it. It was the first summer when I moved down here. I did it with a bunch of guys. And right, a bunch of guys. There was maybe 13 of us, right? Mm -hmm. Out in the humid July evening when they come through with lanterns. And we've got lanterns and, you know, it was their evening walk. Mm -hmm. And they literally didn't interact with us. It was the weirdest thing I've ever done. It was like being a set piece, right? But we were just, you know, we sort of stashed our arms, equipment, we were categorizing stuff. One guy was scrawling uh, headboards, you know, and, uh, and that sort of thing. And it's like, okay, like you can do these small things in real time and this is what is most poignant to people. Mm -hmm. um, so let's keep doing that. And I'm glad I'm not on the line firing a musket and having to clean it anymore because now I can, uh, I get to be the old guy who's the enabler. And so guys come to me and they're like, what hasn't been done yet? And I'm like, well, you could try this. And then and I get a list like five things and I'm like, okay, go, go, go have fun. And then I'm, once in a while, something will come to fruition. And I'm like, this is going to be cool. This is going to be neat because I see a lot of the young interpreters who just eat it up and they're just like, what haven't we done yet? And I'm like, well, yeah. we didn't do this 20 years ago or 15 years ago. So, cause we weren't allowed, maybe you yeah. guys can do it. And they just, whoop, they go and they do it. It's like, okay. Awesome. Uh, no, I, I'm, I'm, I feel that. I feel that a lot. I, I, I know uh, Dave Wilson, uh, Victorian uh, Photo Studio. Dave's, Dave's a guy for that. He actually put one in my ear the other day that I'm like, yeah, we could do that. He came up with an idea. There was some, I think it was a Maryland unit, but basically they marched from, their, uh, from the village um, to meet the rest of the regiment in Georgetown. And it's basically the CNO Canal Trail. Oh, and wow. like you'd go from there to Harper's Ferry. Now Harper's Ferry, you pick up your uniforms and equipment and you continue Harper's Ferry uh, down to Georgetown. Mm -hmm. And it's like, it's flat. I mean, it's miles. You'd still need to train, but it's like, it's flat. How, like you could literally stop. My, my one that it's, it's so inauthentic, but I always thought it would be cool to be find, find a bunch of hard rucking guys 
And there's in, in New York State, the Erie Canal Trail, different segments are built up to different degrees. And a bunch of them have tried to do Civil War days over the past, and they've all fallen on their face. Um, but my thought was, if you could just get eight guys that would start at this one trailhead in, in a place I'm sure no one knows if you're not from there called Manlius, New York, or actually it's in, I think, the town of DeWitt. But anyway, you start there at this, at this trail. And in Chittenango, there's a canal museum. In Canastota, there's a canal museum. And then you can end in like downtown Rome, you know, end up at the Rome Historical Society or, or whatever, um, you know. But my thought was like, you could go and we could be enjoying just out hanging out, you know, catching the random people. Mm -hmm. To my knowledge, there was never was way too much, you know, the whole Empire State. No one was hoofing it. <laughs> to go to go that distance um but it, i just kind of thought wouldn't it be cool and i think it's some of that you know as guys talk you know the uh, there's always that stuff you're right that comes out and if, if you can inspire them um some of the older guys i've, I've watched them with these young guys that are now in college so they were talking about oh well the, when the seventh u.s came in from out west um they put them in the forts along the canadian border um, had they, they ooh, I claim to be a regulars expert and I can't remember this. I think they'd been captured. I think the seventh had been captured and they were technically serving parole. I think. Yeah. And so they put them in, in one of the places they put them was Fort, uh, Fort Niagara. Niagara uh, yeah. Yeah. And so one of the guys said, kids, you organize it. You're going to be the officers. You're going to be the NCOs, but we'll all, we'll come in dark blue scales. What we'll do it. We will show up and support you on this event. And it was funny because one of the kids said to me, what do you think? I said, if you guys want to do it, like people will show up right. because they, again, that same thing, they've never done that before, but also there's the interest of like, we can, what really cool things can we spark? And also a place like Fort Niagara, although it's a bit of a minefield, they have so many <laughs> buses of tourists come in from Niagara Falls. That's like, do you want to learn about civil war history? Yeah. You can make uh, work. Yeah. Yeah. Do you want to know? Do you want to know about a time that America was so scared of Canada that they felt they needed to put forts up? And now it's yeah. like, you know, bring bring me your Tim Hortons, which my buddy. Hey, well, you... this, is, this is the as of now, this is the hardest that border has been. Uh, yeah. Since yeah. 1914. So, you know, Look, man. well, I, I would I'm going to throw out I'm going to throw out 66 since the Fenian raids because I'm willing to bet they yeah, shut yeah. some stuff down until they got a handle on that. That's that was true. the one that was the one that there's a guy who he's he's really um, that's his pension. Right. This other cool thing I think about interpretation is, you know, I, I have so many of these guys that blow up my phone and they're like, you know, what about this detail? And I'm like, uh, I don't know, but here's where you can go look. Cause that's just their passion is, is that specific detail they look into, whether it's ordinance or what have you. But this dude, like his passion is the Fenians. And he's like, can I like, can we talk about like the Fenians in the army of the Potomac? And I'm like, if you've got good stuff, mm -hmm. like that you can actually cogently have a conversation about and not bust into a fake accent, I'd be game. Like if people walk up, if you want to, uh, you know, put a small flag, you know, up or something like that, I'm, I'm totally chill, you know, with, if right. you want to have that conversation. Um, but you're right. It's kind of that enabling. Cause then it'll just be like, well, let's do this. And you know, yeah. And it'll spread like wildfire, but Hey buddy, I've kept you long enough. Oh, I've, man. I've appreciate all your input, man, because I knew that, you know, you've been working alongside the MPS for a long time, not a public historian. And as a, as an interpreter, you know, we both come from the same path in that regard, but you have more experience with getting this stuff together than I do. Because when I was doing hardcore interpretation, we still had a little bit of a, a wall to go through, but uh, yeah. you guys have been doing great stuff. And I know Tyler Greco has been doing great stuff and Jared Foos. Thank God that he's doing it. And Chris Gwynn, all those guys out there have been really helping out a great deal. And we've given them a lot of shout outs this evening. Uh, you know, <laughs> help them a lot. Well, um, but we wouldn't be doing it without them. Exactly. You know, it's, and, and that's the thing that it's, uh, what the reason why I wanted to even start this whole weird, uh, transition in my life with this brand was I wanted to help other historians and you see it with interpretation too, where interpreters now reenactors are starting to help public historians and it's starting to work. So, Hey, think of that. If you work together, good things happen. Good, <laughs> so Good things may just happen. But but I really do appreciate your time, my friend. And yeah. I'm, I'm I'll get caught up on all the 
the comments over the next day and uh, all right and we'll and we'll see where we can go but thanks for thanks for being a part of this man and Please. And, and all that and thanks for tuning in everybody hope you have a wonderful evening take care be safe Thank mm-hmm. you.